If today we're going to be learning Psachim Daf Nun Tet. Today's Daf is sponsored by Belima uh, Sturchheim Selowski in memory of her mother, Mazal Tina Barina, and David on her year at Okay, We are going to now continue where we were. I want to go back because I realized that I didn't explain the last part of the Daf correctly, so I want to correct myself. Um, we're going to go back to, before I start, I just want to review a little bit and, and bring up something that I mentioned in the Shear last night um, that came to me as I was preparing for those who came to the skills class, um, or for those who didn't, I will fill you in, which is our chapter starts off, you would have expected it to start off with the Korban Pesach, but instead it starts off with the Korban Tamid. Korban Tamid is the thing that happens every single day, and we've been talking about that concept. And interestingly, the chapter, our Vep Sachim, which is the 10th chapter, which we'll get to, also, and by the way, the fourth chapter also, Makom Shenagu, we started with Yisro Malachan Erev Pesach, and immediately we said, why didn't they mention Erev Shabbat and Yom Tov? Likewise, in the 10th chapter, they said, why didn't they mention Shabbat and Yom Tov? And when it, Ra, Tosot says, why didn't they just simply say, it's talking about Pesach, and this doesn't have anything to do with Shabbat and Yom Tov? To which one of the answers Tosot gives, I think is very relevant for our chapter two, which is, it's inappropriate to ignore the daily sacrifice, the daily or the weekly things that happen when you're talking about Pesach. And therefore here also, I think it's likely when you're talking about sacrifices, they didn't want to ignore what happens on a daily basis. Don't think that this trumps, right? We have this concept in Halacha, Tadir V'Sheino Tadir Tadir Kodem. Whatever is more common always goes first. You might think the special thing comes first. No, it's what goes on every single day. Okay, so if you have a choice between, let's say, Mincha and Musaf, you forgot to daven Musaf in the morning, you're supposed to daven Mincha first. Okay, if you have a choice, I'll give you a funnier example, between doing the daf yomi, making it up, or making up the once a week shear, you should do the daf yomi first, because that's the tadir, right? That's your everyday thing. Make sure to do your everyday thing rather than, you know, the special thing, even though it's, the special thing is always easier to do because it's special. But the idea is you have to be that it's that consistency that's all, it's what it's all about. So I think these three chapters all start out with somehow bringing it back to, right, whether it's in the other two chapters, it was the Gemara, here it's the Mishnah itself, which starts with Tamid Nishcha. You have to know the basics before you move on to the extras. What's the structure of the temple's daily service before you start getting off into, well, how do they do it on a unique day like Erev Pesach when you have something extra? Okay, with that, we'll get started. The last thing we ended with, I'm going to repeat. So Tanu Rabbanan, it's about 10 lines from the bottom of Nun Cherem Bet. How do you know that nothing can come before the tamid in the morning? Because it says, So Rava says, right? That means whatever goes first. Then we say that it was fine. Um, then we say, How do you know that nothing goes? Right now, that this is the first thing that you start your day with, and it's the last thing they start their day with, the end of their day with in the temple. How do you know that? Because it says, Now, my mistake was that the Aleha, I was explaining, is on the Korban Ben Harbaim. No, it's the morning one. On the morning one, you burn the, the Shlamim, okay, the fats of the Shlamim, which means, so my Talmud, how do you learn this? That means after you do the morning one, then move on and you can do all your Korbanot that you want. But only on the morning one can you then do other sacrifices. But when it comes to the afternoon one, you cannot do loa chavrata. Chavrata is the afternoon one. You can't add anything past the afternoon one. Second one, Matkif la Rava. Rava says, what do you mean? According to that, maybe you just can't bring shlamim, but maybe you could bring korbanot ola after. Right? Because the Pasuk said specifically the shlamim. So El Amarava Hashlamim Aleha Hashlam Kola Korbano Kulam. Again, I explained Aleha wrong. Aleha means on the morning ones. On the morning one, meaning after you do the morning one, finish then all the sacrifices before you get to the afternoon one. Then once you do the afternoon one, you're not allowed to do anything else. Well, the first thing that is, is classic for every rule, there's exceptions to the rule. So even though we've established very clearly yesterday, nothing comes after the Korban Tamid, now we're going to see a bunch of exceptions. Tanu Rabbanan, Tamid Kodem LePesach. For this, it'll be very helpful to have the charts on the sheet. Tamid Kodem LePesach, Pesach Kodem LeKtoret, Ktoret Kodem LeNerot. Okay, this is the order. Okay, I'll say it much simpler than if it gets a little confusing. This is before this. This is before that. This is before that. This basically means very simply: first the Tamid, then the Pesach, then 
the ktoret, which is the incense that was just like the Quran Tamid, where it was done twice a day. They would do incense in the morning and incense in the afternoon. Where was it done? On the inner Mizbeach, inside the sanctuary, where the table with the bread is and where the menorah with the candles are. That's where they would burn the incense in the morning and in the afternoon. So they do that after the Korban Tamid and on Pesach, Erev Pesach, after the Pesach. And that comes before the candles. When the Kohanim light the candles, that's the last thing they do. Okay, now Ketorit and Nerod are not as much of a problem because when we said that it's the last thing we do, we meant the Korban Tamid, the daily sacrifice, is the last thing we do on the altar, that we burn on the altar. Now, the Ketorit is burnt on the altar, but a different altar, so it shouldn't bother us, right? There's the outside altar, the big one, that's the one that they do the, most of the sacrifices on, and the Korban Tamid for sure was brought there. Whereas, right, all the, all the, everything was burnt on that one. The only thing that gets burnt on the inside is the ktoret, and sometimes the blood gets sprinkled on the inside altar that, but not for the korban tamid anyway, but that's not really relevant. We're talking about burning. So really it's the last thing that's burnt other than the korban pesach. So now we're gonna to try to figure out what are all these exceptions to the rule, okay? And where do we get it from? So here your sheet will help you because I put at the beginning of the sheet, all the verses that we're going to extrapolate now. Okay, we're finally getting to why is the Pesach what was bothering us yesterday. If it's so clear that nothing can go after the Korban Tamid, how do we do the Pesach after the daily sacrifice? When it comes to the Korban Tamid, it says, do it ben ha'arbaim. Simply. When it comes to Pesach, there's one verse where it says, do it ba'erev. That's in Dvarim, Perek Tetzayim, Pasuk Vav, chapter 16, verse 6. Slaughter the Pesach in the afternoon. Then in Shmo Perek Yubet, Pasuk Vav, it says at the end of the verse, And they slaughtered the animal for the Pesach, Ben Ha'arbaim. So notice it says, also Erev, and also Ben Ha'arbaim. So they're going to say, because when it comes to the daily sacrifice, it only says Ben Ha'arbaim. And here it says, also Ba'erev and also Ben Ha'arbaim. That must mean it comes even later than the other one. So that's how they learn it. What's the problem with this? Well, then it doesn't make any sense that the Torah and the Nerot happen last. Why? Because you uchar davar shneemar bo ba'erev uben ha'arbaim, the davar shelo neemar bo ela ben ha'arbaim bilvad. Let's look at the verse by the ketoret and the candles. This is in um, chapter 30 of Shemot, Perek Lamed, Pasuk Chet, verse 8. Ubaha'alot aharon et hanerot ben ha'arbaim yaktirena, ben ha'arbaim, yaktirena ketoret tamid lefnei Hashem l'dorot hechem. When Aharon put up the candles, that means he lit the candles, when did he do it? Ben ha'arbaim. When he does that, yaktiren ha'ktoret tamid lefnei Hashem. He should also do the ktoret. So right now it says, when he does the candles, he does the ktoret. And when do you do them both? Ben ha'arbaim. If it's ben ha'arbaim, and our theory just was that erev and ben ha'arbaim comes after ben ha'arbaim, then the order is wrong. The order should be tamid. Okay, based on the simple reading of that verse, you would say candles, Ktoret, because it says when Aaron does the candles, then he burns the incense, which is also the reverse of what appears in our Brita, because Ktoret comes before the candles. And that should all come before the Pesach, because the Pesach has Erev and Ben Harbain. So let's see what the Gemara answers. Shane Hatam, there's a special reason there by the candles, Demiet Rachmana Oto, because the Torah excludes it from the rules by using the word, what's it? The candles. By using the word oto, this is a different verse. In Shemot, chapter 27, verse 21, it says, Be'ol mo'e, where, you, where do you put these candles? In all mo'e mechutz laparoch et asher alaidut, ya'aroch oto aharon u'banav. Aharon and his son should organize it. Ad boker lefnei Hashem chukat olam. So now it says this, oto. What do they use from that word oto? It could have just said ya'aroch. Why did it have to say oto? To teach you, okay, now. We won't yet get to the answer. They're going to have two drush out, and then they're going to talk about the second one, and from there, we're going to get to our answer. So, so patience. Ditanyas, it says in the following, Brighton. So notice it said, Oto, and then it said, Me'erev ad boker, from 
evening till morning. So why does it say Me'erev Aboker? The first explanation has nothing to do with us. This is like Hanukkah candles. How, many, how much oil are you supposed to put in? The amount of time, from when the sun sets, right? That's giving you how much oil you need to put in that's going to last, generally we say half an hour. That's why the standard simple Hanukkah candles, nowadays barely anybody uses those, but the old standard simple Hanukkah candles are supposed to last half an hour. But Davar Acher, the second explanation of it. So this means obviously not half an hour. This means you have to put enough oil in the candle, in the candelabra in the temple to last you from the nighttime till the morning. Davar Acher, a different interpretation of Erev Aboker. Ein lecha voda shekshera me Erev Aboker ela zobelvad. This is to teach you there's only one thing you can do. This, this is the only one. Oto is to teach you, right? This goes me Erev Aboker, meaning, and we're going to see, this is what you do at the end of the day, and it lasts you through till the morning. My timer, how do you understand this? They're kind of taking this trasha one step further. Because it says oto, it's to teach you, only this goes me'erev ad boker. Ve'ein davar acher me'erev ad boker. Meaning, this is the very last thing, because this is the thing that lasts from the night all the way to the morning, so you do it last. Okay? And that's why the wrote come at the end. That explains Nero. What about the Ketoret? Ah, it kash Ketoret. It appears in the same verse. They're juxtaposed. Therefore, whatever is true for candles will be true of the Ketoret. Those two things are done last. That's why they come after the Pesach. But Tanya Kikushyam. But now the Gemara says, by the way, though, there's a bright that reads exactly like we questioned. What did we say in the beginning? Why is it Tamid Pesach Ketoret Nero? It should be Tamid Ketoret Nero in some order. We'll deal with that in a minute. And then Pesach, because Pesach says Erev and Ben Harbayim. So now we're going to say, oh, there's a bright in fact that says that. And that's why I charted them out next to each other so you could see the comparison. Tamid, Kodem Liktoret, right? Tamid comes first, then Ktoret. Ktoret, Kodem at Linerot. So still Ktoret comes before candles, incense before the candles. Vinerot, Kodmot Le Pesach. And the candles come before Pesach. So here you see, and there they're going to explain exactly what we said previously. Right, you're going to always push off the thing that says Erev and Ben Arbaim. That will be the last thing you do. So the Pesach comes at the very end. But what do we do with this Trasha Oto? V'haktiv Oto. Didn't we just darshan that word Oto to say the candles come last? So they say, don't worry about that. Hi Oto mibayale lemiute avodasha bifnim. That Oto comes to exclude something else. That oto comes to exclude something that's done inside, again, inside the sanctuary. What was done inside the sanctuary? Umay nihu ktoret. Now we finally understand why the ktoret comes before the candles, because the oto is to say, this is the last thing you do, and not the ktoret. Now, why is something done inside? Because the candles are inside and the ktoret's inside. So you wouldn't compare it to something that's done outside. We want to compare it to something done inside. So yes, the Pesach is always last, but the, the Nero, the candles, are last in comparison to the Ketoret. Both of them are done inside the sanctuary, and we're basically comparing one to the other. So the Ketoret is done last for that purpose. Okay, Me, I'm sorry, the Nero are done last. The candles are done after the incense is burned. So now they say, you would have thought, as I said before, Ketoret. Because it says in the verse, when Aaron sets up the candles, then he should do the Ketoret. It sounds like the Ketoret happens after. Therefore, you specially needed this Drashan, Rachmana Oto, to teach you the candles go last. Ella, in other words, last compared to the Ketoret. So now they say, well, then how do you explain that verse? So why does it say, do it, Ben Harbaim, and then it says, and burn the incense? So hachi kama rachmana. This is what they say. When you're lighting the candles, the incense should be burning. Now, how does incense burn? You have to burn it beforehand. We want the incense to be going while he's lighting the candles, okay? Which makes sense in terms of the incense, right? Was this beautiful smelling incense. So we want that to be going while he's lighting the candles. That's what it means. When it says, it means the ketoret should be going while the, while the, candles are being lit. 
I'm going to ask a question and leave it for the, for now, because I don't have a good answer and, and it requires much further research, which is, what's the idea here? We understand the idea of the Korban Temi framing your day. First thing, last thing, right? What's the importance of the Torah and the Nerov that they have to be done even later? Okay, now they don't contradict because they're not being burned on any altar. I mean, the Torah is burned on the altar, but like we said, that's the inner altar. That doesn't bother us about the outer altar. The, the idea that that frames your day really is about the, the outer altar, the outer Mizbech. But still it begs the question as to why are these also two things that we need to frame the day in the temple. And we're gonna see now that not only did they do the Ketoret after the Korban Tamid Shalban Arbaim, they also did it before the Korban Tamid in the morning, okay? And maybe it's this idea that you want the aroma going Right, you want it to start. Maybe the aroma has to. Right, it's this rach nichach, this special smell that you want it to kind of pervade your day. So maybe that it's kind of like le laying the groundwork, and the candles are the light, and maybe that's just basics that need to be there. But again, I'm sure there's a lot more to be said about it. I don't know enough about it. Tanu Rabbanan. So now we're going to say, as I said before, Ein lechadavar shekodim letamid shal shachar. Nothing comes before the korban tamid in the morning. Elak toret bilvad. Only the incense. Shnei Marba. Now, why? Where did they learn it from? And again, this Gemara is very much. We're going to learn it from the text, right? Whatever the text says, we're going to right extrapolate it from the text. But what I'm trying to say is there must be some greater idea behind this. So it says Baboker Baboker. It says in the morning twice by the Torah. So therefore, you've done Torah of Shnei Marba Baboker Baboker. It's the same idea as Erev and Ben Arbaim. Here, Baboker Baboker actually appears in the same verse. There, Erev and Ben Arbaim were two separate verses, even two separate books of the Torah. But it's the same idea. Here's the verse. Okay, Aaron should do the ktoret samim, the incense, every morning, and it says it twice. And therefore, that should come before davar That should come before something where it only says boker once. What's that? The korban tamit. Right? And then the other one you do, Ben Harbayim. There it just says Boker once. So therefore, we learn it comes before. And now we're going to have another version of what we saw before with some minor variations. The only thing that comes after the Tamid Shalbein Arbaim, okay, right, what would you say? Pesach, Toret, Nerot. But what does it say here? Elak, Toret, Venerot, Upesach, so far so good. Umechusar Kipurim, Be'erev Pesach. Whoa, okay, what is this? So, mechusar kipurim, we need to explain some terminology. We've seen this before, but we'll talk about it again, which is someone like a mitzora, someone who has tzarad, or a zav, or a zava, or a yoledet, someone who gave birth. All those people go through a process, sometimes a seven-day process, sometimes more. On the last day of their process, they go to the mikvah. The day after that, they're still not finished. After they go to the mikvah, so they can eat truma that night, let's say they're a kohen, they wait till the sun sets and they eat truma. But on the next day, so for many of them, it's the eighth day, the yoled that the person who gives birth is different. But the next morning, they have to bring a sacrifice. You can't bring sacrifices at night. So they couldn't do it at night. They bring it the next morning. Until they bring their sacrifice the next morning, they are called mechusar kipurim. That means they're missing atonement. They're not fully atoned. What's the relevance of this? The main relevance is they can still eat truma because that we already said, once they go to the mikvah the day before, they can eat truma in the evening. But what can't they do? They cannot eat sacrificial meat. So let's say you're a mechusar kipurim. Here's our example on Erev Pesach. It's your eighth day, let's say, of mitzora. Okay, you're a leper, leper and you did your process and it's day number eight, you're supposed to bring your sacrifice. For whatever reason, you don't bring it in the morning. Okay, you forgot, you didn't take care of it. Okay, kind of silly, but you didn't take care of it. What happens? They bring the korban tamid in the afternoon and all of a sudden you come and say, hey, wait, wait for me. I want to do my korban. I didn't bring it. Right? You can imagine people looking at you like, what are you crazy? <laughs> it's Arab Pesach. You know, you didn't think about it this morning. And you might think tough luck comes the Gemara and says, or the Brita and it says, you can also, this is a sacrifice we're going to allow you to bring even after the korban tamid. Okay, we're going to have a big discussion. How on earth do we allow this? But we're going to allow you to do this. Why? Because if you don't, what will happen? You can't eat the meat tonight of your Karban Pesach. Now, first of all, if you're already in a group of people, remember what we said? 
If you have your group and some people can't eat it, it disqualifies it. So first of all, you're messing up other people and you're messing up yourself. And if you don't eat the Korban Pesach, you get curry. That's very serious. So because of the seriousness of it, this is what we call, right? There's, there's a, a, a balance going on here. There's one hand, the Korban Pesach and, and the importance of doing it. And therefore you have to bring this other Korban to be able to enable yourself to do that. On the other hand, right? On the other hand of the, of the seesaw, we have this, you're not allowed to do anything after the Korban Tamid. So what do we say? In this case, we're going to allow it to override. So what does he do? We allow you to bring your sacrifice after the Korban Tamid, and you go to the mikvah again, because to allow you to eat Kodshim, apparently you have to tovel again, and you can eat Kodshim in the evening. Um, sorry, I skipped. Okay, then the Brayta continues and goes even farther than this. Rabbi Yishmael, ben Asher Rabbi Yochanan ben Broka, Omer, af mechusar kipurim b'shar yimot hashana. Forget about on Erev Pesach. We can even do this on any day of the year. Now, why would we push this off on a regular day of the year? Who cares whether he brings his korban on the eighth day or not? Well, Rashi says that we're talking about a case and everyone understands this. We're talking about a case where, let's say, you're a mechusar kipurim, and let's say, Okay, I couldn't bring sacrifices because I was a uh, Yoledet, okay? And I wanted to wait to bring a bunch of sacrifices. So I made a voluntary offering. I bring that to the temple in the morning, but I didn't yet finish my other sacrifices. So I have a sacrifice that I brought that I want to eat the meat of. Now, according to Rashi, uh, it's a mitzvah say to eat the meat of a korban that I bring, okay? Because theoretically, I could give it to someone else. But there's a mitzvah, I say, and in fact, this is very interesting. I'm not going to get into this, but I will tell you, the Raman doesn't count this as a mitzvah, and it's one of the mitzvah. In fact, it's the first one, the Ramban, on Sefer Mitzvah, the Rambam, he has all of his comments on the Rambam. And one of the things, he, the first mitzvah he lists, he lists at the end of his book on the Rambam, he says, the Rambam forgot a whole slew of mitzvot that the Rambam didn't count, that the Ramban thinks is a mitzvah. And the first one is this, Okay eating kochen. The Ramban says, and it's clear from our Gemara, and we basically have to figure out how the Rambam understood it, that it's a mitzvah to say to eat sacrificial meat that you bring up, a sacrifice that you bring. So that we get from here. So because you have this mitzvah on a regular day, if you brought another sacrifice, and now that you didn't bring the ones you're obligated to bring, you can't eat it. Basically, we allow you to do it after sacrificing the korban to meat. Okay, even though theoretically we have this, what they're going to call in the Gemara later, a mitzvah to say of Korban shlami, uh, the hashlema le kola korbanot, right? You're not allowed to do anything after the korban tamid. You have, or I would say it's a positive. This has to be the last thing you do. So we have a mitzvah. This is supposed to be the last thing you do, the korban tamid. We have another mitzvah of eating kodshim. And we basically, right, we put them on a scale and one weighs out over the other, which we're going to debate a little bit because how can we do this? Okay. And as how can you say one mitzvah, I say overrides another one. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. By the way, get that this week, Rabbi Yael Shimoni talks about this whole issue. In Pirkei Avot, it says, right, you can't, it's famous, right? You can't, you don't know, don't choose mitzvot and say, oh, this one, right? You don't know the rank of mitzvot. But this Gemara, we're going to see, they clearly do rank mitzvot. So it's interesting. So now the Gemara says, they're going to start questioning. Bishlama le Tanakama. I understand Tanakama, who says, when it's Erev Pesach, we allow it, but not on a regular day. Yavoa say the Pesach, she yesh bo Here, we're going to see, we're ranking mitzvot. Pesach has curry associated with it. So that will come the, um, I just lost my place, sorry. And that will override the assay of hashlama, of finish the day with the korban tamid, because there's no curry associated with that. So we're going to have, we have curry, we're going to obviously, that's going to weigh heavier. But if you have two equal mitzvot say, why are we going to say that one overrides the other? Why are we going to say we're going to allow you to sacrifice after the korban tamid when it's, right, there's two mitzvot say, eat the kodshim, right? You want to eat your other sacrificial meat that you have versus this issue of the korban tamid, that that should be the last. So Amar Ravina, Amar Ravchista, Hacha Bechatada Ofaskina. We're going to have two answers, Ravchista and Ravpapa. Ravchista says, it must be talking about a case where the one sacrifice you have left, okay, most of these, I can't get into all these details now, we're going to learn all this later, but 
all of these sacrifices you usually have to bring a few to get the Mitzorah has three, the Oledet has two, a Chatat and an, o, and an Ola. Most of them have a Chatat and an Ola and an Asha maybe, or depending on which one, there's combos of three korbanot you have to bring. And if you don't have money, so you don't always have to bring an animal, you could bring a bird instead. So here he says, we're talking about when what you have left is one sin offering and it's a bird sin offering. Why is that different? She'en is mezbech el adama, because the bird sin offering none of the meat gets burnt on the altar. Remember the whole problem. We don't want to burn anything on the altar. Well, guess what? In this sacrifice, you don't have to burn anything on the altar. All you do is put the blood on the altar. That's just the blood. So therefore, we've resolved this issue according to Rav Chista. So we'd have to say, though, that it's only in a specific case where that's the only thing left. Rav Papa Amar, Filu Tema Bechatat Behema. Even if you have to bring a chatat from an animal, I can explain it also. Even though the animal generally has to be burnt, I'll give you the solution. Here's a solution. What do you do? Remember we talked about this four main avodot I told you, this intro that we did is going to come up a lot and you'll remember it now. You slaughter. You collect the blood, right? There's shrita, kabbalah, holacha. You walk the blood to the altar, zrika. Those are the four main. What happens after that? You burn the imurim on the mizbeach. Those are parts of the animal that are supposed to be burnt on the altar, right? There's fats and there's some inner parts. So that gets burnt. Now, in this case, we want to basically have a case where we don't burn anything. The last thing that's burnt is the korban tamid. So what do they say? Bring the korban, do all four actions, the main ones, and then bring the animal up. Don't burn it at the top of the altar. The altar was huge, by the way. Okay, we're going to get into the sizes and all that later. It was huge. Put it on the side of the mizbeach, okay, somewhere on the altar. doesn't matter where. Not where the fire is going. Don't burn it. And then what do you do? Let it sleep overnight on the Mizbech. Now, normally, you have to finish everything with that korban during the day. If you leave it overnight, we've called it, we talked about this already, psul lina. You've left it overnight, it's disqualified. But it's like the game of tag. You're safe on base, right? If you're on base, you're okay, no one can get you. Likewise, if you leave this on the top of the altar, it's protected overnight. It doesn't get disqualified. It's only disqualified, it's not on the altar. If you leave it on the altar, it's almost like as if it was burned or it's burning. So you're okay. So leave it, don't burn it. And then we resolve our issue. We don't burn anything after the korban tamid. It's true, we brought a sacrifice, but we didn't burn it. Then it's okay. So now they say, wait, that's all. Okay, so we're gonna have a few questions. So now they say, well, what about, that was all assuming it was a chatat, especially according to Rav Chista, who said it's only a chatat of where nothing gets burned. But they say, vayika asham. But if you're, let's say, a mitzvah, you have to bring a korban asham. If that's the case, right? Well, where's your korban asham? We assume, right? You didn't bring a few korban out here. You're mechusar kipurim. So bishlam ala rav papa, rav papa can easily say, hainu demelin la. You do the exact same thing. You leave it on top of the altar till tomorrow. And then you burn it, obviously, the next day. Ela le rav chista ma'ika lameimar. But what can rav chista say? Amre shakare v'shamo. Ah, this person's mechusar kipurim because they did some. They just left over one of them. They left over the chatada. Oh, they did, they did the asham already in the morning. Then they say, Vaika Ola, but like, let's say you're a Mitzorah, you have to do a Korban Ola. The Chitem Ola Loma Akva. Now, maybe you say, maybe you can achieve atonement without bringing the Ola. Maybe the Ola is an extra. Why would you think the Ola is different? Well, Chatad and Asham sound like they are guilt and sin, sin and guilt offerings. That's something, in order to get atonement, you need to take care of your sin and your guilt offering. But you don't necessarily, the Ola is like an extra, like a nice thing. It's a sacrifice that goes fully to God. Maybe you can get atonement even without bringing the Ola. But they say but that's not true. The Hatanya, it says in a Brayta, and this is the exact person who we were, whose opinion we're trying to explain. Rabbi Yishmael ben Asher Rabbi Yochanan ben Baruch Omer, Keshem shechatato va'ashamo ma'akvino to, kach alato ma'akavto. The Ola does prevent you from fulfilling your, you won't be atoned for if you didn't do the Ola. The chitema kishe karvalato, maybe you'd say, bishe karvalato, maybe you'd say, well, maybe it's the case like we said before with the Asham. He'd already done the Ola. But that can't work. Why? Umi karval lato kodem lachatato. We shown you can't bring the ola before the chatat. We're now going to learn more rules. Okay, this is how classic way in Gemara. Slowly, we're learning all sorts of rules. The chatat has to when you have a pair, which often comes like a yoled that brings a chatat and an ola, and lots of other ones like the asham and the mitzorah and uh, sorry, the mitzorah and, and some others. They bring them. You bring the chatat and the ola. You always have to do the chatat second. Okay, the Ola comes, uh, sorry. Okay, let's read. 
והקריב את אשר לחטאת ראשונה, וחטאת has to come first, which means that if the חטא was left, then obviously the עול is left. So then we're stuck back with our question, what do we do with this קורבן עולה? Okay, for some reason, I don't know why, they don't think that you could leave the עולה overnight. Okay, so now they say. Maybe just because they have a better answer, which we'll get to soon. So matamud lomar. Now, these, now we're moving into verses that talk about a sin offering. So it says you bring, now sin offering, again, I'm telling you lots of details. It's hard to get through the daf because there's so many things you need to know, which is there's a korban called the chatat olevi yored, which is a sin offering that is a sliding scale. That means if you're wealthy, you bring an animal. If you're not wealthy, you bring two birds. If you're even less wealthy, you bring a mincha offering, which is just flour and water. Give someone a chance of someone who needs to do a sin offering for doing something unwittingly to basically have a way out if they can't afford it. So it says there, when you bring, when the two birds, the middle option where you bring, you know, then you have to bring instead of one chatat, you now have to bring two, a chatat and an ola, but two birds, which are a lot less expensive than, a, than an animal. So it says, asher rishona. So now they say, this is a good example of the Torah doesn't waste words. So it says, you bring the chatat first, and then it says, why do you need that? If you want to say it's because it comes before the ola, it already says, you should bring the ola second. So obviously, if the ola is second, the chatat is first. So there's no reason for both these verses. So what is the second one coming to teach you? This creates a rule for everywhere, not just in the ola v'yoreg. But anywhere, every time you have a pair, okay, this is a whole Masech Kinim. Anyone who learned the daf last time knows it's a whole Masech Kinim, which we're going to learn just the Mishnah of. It's one of those unique exceptions where we learn a parak of Mishnah, a uh, Masech of Mishnah in the daf Yomi cycle. There we have a whole discussion of every time you bring these pairs of birds, one for Ola, one Chatat. For Chatat, there's all these mathematical interesting calculations. So anyway, it says here, this gives you the rule that every time you have both, you have to bring the chata first. So if the chata is left, obviously the ola is left. Even in a case, again, I'm not gonna get into all the details when you do this, but sometimes the case where it's not a bird, two birds, it's an animal and a bird. So even when the animal is, the, the ola is the animal and the chata is the bird, that's the only combo you could have animal and bird, then, even then, you might think the behema goes first. No, because the behema, an animal is more important than a bird. No, still the chatat goes first. So how do you explain this? So Amarava is one exception to the rule, and that must be the one he's discussing. Shane olat mitzora, derachmana amar vehela kohen et ha'ola. It says, and the, and the coin brings the ola, and it says, she'ela kva. Here they're telling you that he had all, the way they understand that verse, he had already brought the Ola. They're talking about the Chatan, and then it says, and he had already brought the Ola. Meaning there's one exception to the rule where the Ola comes first, and that must be the case that we're discussing according to Rav Chista, that this case was the Ola was already brought, and all we're left with is the Chatat, and that's why, according to Rabbi Shmuel ben Ashur, Rabbi Yochanan ben Baraka, you can do this sacrifice even after the Korban Tamid, because nothing actually gets burnt on the altar, okay? Now we're gonna have more discussion of these opinions. But Papa, if you remember, said we're gonna put it up and leave it on the altar all night. So now we're gonna discuss his opinion a little bit and ask some questions. Amalei Rav Shem and Bar'aba le Rav Papa. Lididach de Amav, ma'aleha umilina b'rosho sho mizbeach, kaimin va'avdina milta da lekwanim da'atu balide takala, desav rei de yomi hu va'atelak ture. This is gonna create, this is exactly what we were discussing yesterday, a logistical nightmare. You're gonna have animals at the top of the altar that you're not planning to burn. Now, what did the Kohanim do at the end of the day? Okay, we're gonna see this later also. They look around and they see whatever wasn't burned, they make sure it burns all night, okay? Which is gonna be a question, how do they burn things? Didn't we say you can't burn anything on the altar after the Korban Tamid? So we'll get back to that. But they basically, whatever's still on the altar, they make sure it gets burned. So if you put these parts, they're supposed to be burned on the top of the altar, the Kohanim are gonna get mixed up. They're gonna think that you're supposed to burn them and they're gonna burn them that night. And that's gonna to totally be a problem because if you burn them, now it ends up that your sacrifice was done after the Korban Tamid Shalbena Arbaim, which wasn't allowed, right? As long as you don't burn it, you're fine. But if you burn it now, it's gonna be a problem. So what did they answer? And this is what we've been discussing the last few days. On the one hand, the Kohanim were corrupt. On the other hand, there's this concept that the Kohanim know what they're doing. So there's always this seesaw back and forth between you know, the ideal, the way it's supposed to be, that the Kohanim are supposed to be on top of everything. This is their job. Their main job is to be on top of everybody's sacrifice. 
who sacrificed her, we'll talk about with Karma Pesach. I mean, you would go in a group and you would give your carbon, and the, the, the coin would do it, and then you'd get the meat back. How did they know whose meat was whose, right? That was their job. So the Kohanim are very careful about these things. So they'll know, right? They'll put a sign on the animal somehow. They'll make everybody know this animal doesn't get burned tonight. Amr Rav Ashi Rav Kahana, Amr Le Rav Huna, Bered Rav Natan, Rav Papa. Okay, so either Rav Ashi said to Rav Kahana or Rav Huna, Bered Rav Natan said to Rav Papa. There's another problem here. What's the problem? Now, the whole idea is we want this person to be able to eat his meat tonight. We want him for the Korban Pesach tonight, for the other sacrifices for that day. And that's why we're allowing this. Now, when do you get to eat? When your atonement process is finished. Now we're going to have a bit of a problem, and it's going to be a few levels till we get to the question. As long as you don't burn those parts on the altar, which we're not burning till tomorrow, the koanim can't eat the meat of the sacrifice, right? There's parts of the meat the koanim get, like the, it depends which sacrifice. Sometimes they get all the meat. Sometimes they get right all the meat other than the parts burnt on the altar. Sometimes they get the chazev shok, the chest and the, and the thigh. So if, and now, why should we care if the koanim can't eat it? But we'll see. Right now, we're assuming since you didn't burn it, the koanim can't eat. How do we know this? Maybe they can eat their parts before the parts get burnt on the altar. Talmud Lomar, but it says in the verse, He burns the chelev, those are the parts you burn, the fats that you burn on the altar. And then, after that, it says, So we take the order literally. First burn, then you can eat your parts, which also makes sense, right? God should get his share before we get our share, right? If you view the korban, the burning is, it's if we're offering it up to God. And therefore, only after that can the coin eat his part. The kama, now, why is this relevant to us? Well, here's the second stage. If the koanim don't eat the meat, it's one of the preconditions for atonement. The koanim have to eat the meat. In this case, you didn't burn it. The koanim can only eat the meat once it's burned. You didn't burn it. You left it for tomorrow. That means the koanim can't eat the meat. If the koanim can't eat the meat, you don't get atonement. So how on earth does this resolve the issue of the person who wants to eat the meat, right? His own sacrificial meat that night or that day. And how do we know that if the koanim don't eat the meat, the owners don't get atonement? Detanya, as it says in a brighta, va'achlu otam, this is about Aharon and his sons, they eat the meat, asher kupar bahem. They eat what they receive of the meat, asher kupar bahem, which creates atonement, meaning their eating allows the atonement. Without them eating, there's no atonement. Milamed, this is what they say in the bright about this verse. This teaches shakonim ochlim uvalim mitkaprim. That only when the koanim eat, the owners get atoned for. So now, how do we explain this? So we say, ah, this is an exception to the rule. Amarle, kevandilo efsha. In a normal case, when you can burn the imurim that day, then the koanim can eat the meat after, only after, right? Only after it's burned, that's always. And then that provides atonement. And without that, it doesn't. But kevandilo efsha. Since they can't, it's parallel to a case. What happens if I bring a sacrifice? And I do all the four, remember, the four main things, which end with the sprinkling of the blood before we burn these parts on the altar. Let's say then the parts that were supposed to go on the altar either got lost or became impure, which means we cannot put them on the altar either because they're not here or because they're impure. So what happens? So they're now going to say, since, you can't burn them, and therefore the Kohanim can't eat the meat. In this case, it's as if they got lost or impure, because it's impossible to deal with them today. Titania, and what's the law about that? It says in a Braita, You might have thought if they become impure, they get lost. The Kohanim can't eat the Chazev Ashok. Now we're going to actually say the Kohanim in this, not only, right? The koanim can actually eat the meat in this case, just like if it became impure or got lost. The koanim would be allowed to eat the meat. Talmud Lomar, how do we know this? They say, it says, the chazeh and the, and the, um, the chaze goes, the chest goes to Aharon. This goes to Aharon and his sons no matter what. Meaning, if there's, when there's meat to burn, you have to burn the meat and only then can they eat it. And again, when they eat it, the owners get atonement. But now they're saying, if there's no meat to be burned, or like in our case, it can't be burned today, 
right? It's a, it's a big chidush to make that jump because this really could be burned tomorrow. But the whole idea is that we want to allow the owner to have atonement since it can't be burned today because of this other issue of that the korban tamid has to be the last thing on the altar. Therefore, we say it's as if it was lost or impure, can't be burned. Since it can't be burned, the kohanim are allowed to eat the meat. When they eat the meat, then the owner becomes, receives his atonement. And that resolves our issue. We're now going to have two side issues. And with this, we'll end. We'll start with the new mission tomorrow because it's a whole new topic of lishma and lo lishma. And I want to give a proper intro. So we'll do that tomorrow. Right now, we're going to bring two contradictory verses, like two sets of contradictory verses. One Rav Kahana brings one Rav Safa. Rav Kahana Rami, he raises a contradiction between two verses. Ktiv, lo yalin chelev chagi ad bokeh says you can't leave the fat and not burn them on the altar until the morning, meaning ad boker hu delo yalin, you can't leave them till the morning, ha kolalai la kula yalin, but this sounds like, let's say you left them overnight and you didn't deal with them and you didn't burn them, you can burn them at night. Now, how does this work? Uktiv biktir alech habash lamin. This is what I mentioned before, that's a bit of a problem. How are we burning these fats from sacrifices if we said the last thing that burns on the altar has to be the korban tamid of ben arbaim, the afternoon daily service, so the daily sacrifice, how can we burn these fats overnight, right? If you didn't burn them, this is if you remember a long time ago in Brachot, we said, tefilo keneged avot or keneged korbanot, we just mentioned this the other day, if they're neged korbanot, sacrifices, so what about mariv? There's no sacrifices at night, the nighttime prayer. They say it's because of the evarim uptarim, the parts of the animal that are burnt all night on the altar. Basically, at night, the Kohanim would come and they would burn whatever didn't get burned before. So how can you do that if we just said nothing can burn on the altar after the Korban Tamid? Again, another exception. And Aleha Shleim, Kola Korban Okulam, meaning in the daytime, not after the Korban Tamid. So who motiv la who he explains it, Kishani Totu. Those are only parts that are left over. In other words, you can't start a sacrifice and get through all the processes and burn it on the altar after you did the korban tamid of the afternoon. But if you have things left over that didn't get dealt with and you just need to burn them, but they're, the blood was done and everything else was done before the afternoon sacrifice, then you're okay. Okay, so that's our distinction that we're making here. Last thing for today, Rami Le Rav Safra. He brought the following contradiction. Le Rav, in front of Rav. Ktiv, lo yalin laboker zeva chaga pesach. Says you can't leave the, the sacrifice of the pesach till the morning. Laboker hu lo yalin. Ha kolalala yalin, right? It seems to say you can't leave it till the morning, but again, if you didn't, now when are you supposed to burn the chalev of the Korban Pesach? On the 14th, Erev Pesach, when you do the sacrifice in the afternoon. But if you didn't, you can do it that night. Now, this creates a problem. The Haktiv, it says, Olat Shabbat Shabbato. Now, what did they learn from that? You're supposed to bring the Korban Olav Shabbat on each Shabbat, right? On each Shabbat. But this means you can't deal with a korban from a weekday on Shabbat, and you can't deal with a korban on a weekday on Yom Tov. Right? We learned that in the Mikdash, to bring sacrifices, you could be mechalal Shabbat. You could do whatever you want, desecrate Shabbat. But not if it was left over from something on a weekday. So here's a classic example. Erev Pesach is a weekday, right? It might be a holiday in terms of the, you had to slaughter the korban Pesach, but it's not a holiday. You, know, you can do work. So you can't push off. It's still called a Yom Chol. You can't push off from a weekday to Yom Tov. So how on earth at Yom Tov at night, right? That night of the 15th, are we burning something that was left over from the 14th? That was a regular weekday. Your question is not new, Rav says to him. It was already asked to Rabbi Abal and he explained, that Pasuk was only talking about when the 14th is on a Shabbos. When it's on Shabbat, Remember the relationship between Shabbat and Yom Tov? Yom Tov is less than Shabbat in terms of its sanctity. So if you dalid like this year, Erev Pesach comes out on Shabbat, then you can leave the chaylev to be burnt at night. Because right, that it's, you're just finishing up what you didn't do on your dalid. So you can't do that if it's normal year, but you can do it on Shabbat. So it comes a very interesting question and answer here. Amrle. Just because you're stuck with this question, we're going to basically say that verse that seems very general. And it says, don't leave the Pesach until the morning, meaning you could sac you could burn the fats of the Pesach in the nighttime. That verse is only on Erev, on when Pesach fall, Erev Pesach falls on Shabbat. So you say, you're going to take that Pesach out of context and say it's only when Pesach falls on Shabbat? 
to which it's kind of a funny answer. He answers him, um, I have no choice. Okay, this is like saying because. Okay, why are you doing this? Because, because I have no choice. There's no other way to understand that verse. In other words, that verse makes absolutely no sense that we'd be able to take something that was done on the 14th, which is a regular weekday, and we're going to allow us to burn it on Yom Tov. No way, no how. Can't be, that must be, and as we're stuck, and there's no other way to understand that verse, therefore we have to explain, yes, that verse is only on Shabbat, even though it didn't say anything of the sort in the verse itself. With that, we'll end, and like I said, we'll pick up from this issue of doing a Pesach Lishma or Lishma tomorrow. Have a great day, everybody.